called Pentecost. This is also the first year that Pentecost has fallen on the same day as Wesley's Aldersgate, Aldersgate experience in, I think, 67 years. Wesley uh, was depressed at his time here in the colonies. He had gone back to England. He had been run out of Georgia. Um, he had tried to convert the heathens. Now, whatever you read into that, as in Georgia, um, they it was not just because they were bad people. They were a debtor's colony. People were sent to Georgia that they had debt to pay. Um, Wesley came over and got in a little trouble trying to be too much of a disciplinarian as a priest. And he left and he was very discouraged about his ministry. He was sitting in his room and somebody came by his room in the dormitory and said, are you going to the prayer meeting at St. Paul's in, at Aldersgate? And he said, no, I don't really want to. I'm just going to stay here and finish up my work. And we'll just go to bed early. Anyway, he writes in his journal later on that evening, I went reluctantly to Aldersgate Street to evening prayer at St. Paul's. There, as they were reading Martin Luther's preface to the Roman epistle, I felt my heart strangely warm, which reminds us that it's not always about the way we feel. It's about what God is doing through us, that the Holy Spirit comes upon us at unusual times. So today, May 24th, he was strangely warm in the heart, and we remember that. And we also remember this day of Pentecost. Let us, uh, if you hear nothing else this morning, remember that God loves you and that God wants you to be a part of his life and he wants to be a part of yours. With that, let us uh, prepare our hearts and our minds for holy worship. <laughs> Suddenly, there was a sound like the roaring of a mighty wind. 
and storm in the skies above them, and it filled the house where they were meeting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on their heads. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in languages they didn't know, for the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. Many godly Jews were in Jerusalem that day for the religious celebrations, having arrived from many nations. And when they heard the roaring in the sky above the house, crowds came running to see what it was all about and were stunned to hear their own languages being spoken by the disciples. How can this be, they exclaimed, for these men are all from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking all the native languages of the lands where we were born. Here we are, Parthenians, Medes, Elamites, men from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia Minor, Hyda, Tangelia, Egypt, the serene language area of Libya, visitors from Rome, both Jews and Jewish converts, Cretans and Arabians. And we all hear these men telling in our own languages about the mighty miracles of God. They stood there amazed and perplexed. What can this mean, they ask each other. But, but others in the crowd were mocking. They're drunk, that's all, they said. Then Peter stepped forward with the eleven apostles and shouted to the crowd, Listen, all of you, visitors and residents of Jerusalem alike. Some of you are saying these men are drunk. It isn't true. It's much too early for that. People don't get drunk by 9 a.m. No. <laughs> what you see this morning was predicted centuries ago by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God said, I will pour out my Holy Spirit upon all mankind, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions, and your old men dream dreams. Yes, the Holy Spirit shall come upon all my servants, men and women alike, and they shall prophesy. And I will cause strange demonstrations in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and clouds of smoke. The sun shall turn black and the moon blood red before that awesome day of the Lord arrives. But anyone who asks for mercy from the Lord shall have it and shall be saved. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. About everybody being in one place, they were all in one house. The disciples and who they were hanging out with. And this, what happened in this day? What happened to the weather? Something happened. There's a whole bunch of wind. Oh, a whole bunch of wind, okay. A storm. That, that was an interesting version. That was an interesting translation. What's that? Lightning. Yeah, lightning. That's right. With a storm, there comes lightning and, and wind. A hurricane. And a hurricane. Have you ever been in a hurricane? Have you been in a hurricane? At the beach. At the beach, yeah, I bet. Uh, and, and you know a hurricane is called. You lost your surfboard. Yeah. Well, if it's not tied down, it's going to go, right? Yeah. I feel like that was all pretty well. Yeah, that's right. But what happens? If the wind blows and the hurricane and everything gets stirred up, can you see all the debris all over the place? And there's all kinds of, we would say there's destruction, right? The sand flies up your face. The sand flies up your face. Do you think that might have been what had happened on that first Pentecost? Possibly. God says that he's the Holy Spirit coming to, what do you think? Wind kind of stirs us up, doesn't it? The Holy Spirit comes in many different ways. It comes to stir us up like that. It also comes in the spirit and the presence of peace and calmness. It also comes in the presence of fire. God is all of these things. God has created all of these things. God makes his presence known to us in many ways. But this wind is supposed to stir us up and to you can think about it, breathe on us, okay, like he did in the beginning. He breathed into us the breath of life, and the spirit is like breath that gives us action. And he created the breath, right? Breathe into us the breath of life, life and he moves us. 
because we move that we give glory to God. Because we move and have being, we are God's creatures and God loves us so much. And God continues to send his spirit upon us, everybody in here. Let us pray. God, we thank you for wind and breath and fire and we thank you for all the ways that you show us the spirit. Continue to guide and shape our lives after your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all so much. Hear the words of the gospel according to St. John. When the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who comes from the Father, he will testify on my behalf. You also are to testify because you have been with me from the beginning. But I have said these things to you, that when your hour comes, you may remember that I told you about them. I did not say these things to you from the beginning, because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me, yet none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, then I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will, he will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin because they do not believe in me. About righteousness because... I am going to the Father, and you will see me no longer. And about judgment, because the ruler of this world has been condemned. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will speak not on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. 
He will glorify me because I, he will take what is mine and declare to you, all that my Father has is mine. For this reason I said that I will take what is mine and declare it to you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Disciples probably welcomed the idea of returning to some sort of regular normalcy. After the past several weeks, we've been talking about resurrection appearances, we've been talking about Jesus levitating up sort of outside the box kind of stuff for the disciples to see, sort of outside the box kind of stuff for us to see. They were probably Ah, ready for something to be normal again. After Jesus popping in and out of, of appearing and disappearing without notice. I'm here, no I'm not. Huh? See me? Yeah, you can. He's flesh and bone. He's a ghost. He's a spirit presence. He's not in the tomb. He's now rising up above the earth in the ascension. What's that all about? However, this second feast, 50 days later, or should I say seven weeks after the Passover, the Feast of the Pentecost is the annual festival in the life of the Jewish people 
that celebrated the first fruits of the winter spring harvest. It's actually, um, the custom of Pentecost is actually uh, associated with the Israelites' terrifying yet formidable experience with God's revelation at Mount Sinai. You remember when they were wandering, God told Moses, now you tell the people to stay here. And you come up to the mountain with me, and I will give you further instructions. I'll tell you how to organize the people. We'll tell you what's right and what's wrong. We'll give you a list of things that you can do and what you can't do. So Moses tells the people, and then he goes up on a mountain. And there's lightning, and there's thunder, and there's a whole cloud and business of that kind of stuff going on up on that mountain. And the people down, on the, uh, down in the valley are going, whoa, there's something happening up there. And it was. That's how God's presence was manifest and revealed to the people that somewhere through this storm cloud and this cloud of glory, that's where God was revealed. So this Pentecost, year after year, would uh, give the people a chance to remember the prophetic visions of God's glory, God's awesome presence, and how it was revealed through a witness from heaven and tremendous earth-shaking experiences and other unexplainable supernatural episodes. The last time that something like this happened was 600 years before in the dedication to the Feast of the Temple of Solomon. And the Feast of Solomon's Temple, the dedication of Solomon's Temple, was when God came down and actually lit fire to the altar and burned up all the sacrifices. And the glory of the Lord filled his temple. But they knew they waited year after year after year, and they knew that God had promised to do something amazing again. This particular year that we speak about, a handful of women and a handful of men who had been following Jesus up until now had gathered in the house, they say probably the upper room, where they were hiding out for these seven weeks, during the Pentecost festival, wondering what to do next. Remember, they have just been with Jesus in a resurrected form. They had just been through the cross, through watching their friend die on the cross, and three days later, they watched him appear again, and all of a sudden, they saw him go up and levitate up into the sky. You know, it, it might be that the, these followers of Jesus who were once enthusiastically motivated seven weeks ago by Jesus' resurrection had become restless and impatient, <laughs> wondering what to do now. When do we get to put this fire into action? You know, and, and if you let people, you know, sit for a while after being enthusiastic, they kind of cool off, you know? The recently eager and excited followers may have grown a little tired of the repetition of Jesus appearing and disappearing every so often within five minutes of each other without notice. And they may have become complacent. These appearances, maybe, of the resurrection of Jesus may have become routine. They may have become repetitive. So these disciples might have reached their pinnacle of their excitement and were wondering what to do next in sharing this new life in the resurrection. The last instructions that they had were to go <coughs> and wait. Until when? Until they had been clothed with the power from on high. They were to wait for the direction of God's spirit. And they waited, and they waited, and of course their excitement starting to die out. But something did happen. Isn't that the way God is with us today? That when we become complacent, or as the song just said, restless, 
He stirs in us and begins to unfold in our lives. Just when things become normal and unusual, God stirs up the wind. Just when we become uh, a, a little bit complacent or normal or routine or repetitive, God comes and something stirs us up. The event <coughs> members of the day, the committee that put on these festivals, must have been frantic when the wind started to blow. In the middle of the day, the festival had suddenly become a disorganized chaos. It had, the wind had come through the, the Jerusalem, the city, and had uprooted the tent stakes, turned over the tables. The vendors were losing their, their trinkets that they were going to sell. The wind was rushing across the tables and turning over the, the food carts. It was, it was utter chaos. The wind was blowing in this festival into an untidy mess. Tents turned upside down. Debris scattered across the fields. You couldn't even play a good game of kickball in the fields because the ball would be carried away in the wind. People were hunkering down, trying to hide in the alcoves of the temple. Something had gone terribly wrong. Or, should we say from this side, emphatically right. Those responsible for the day, that committee, had no backup plan for what was happening. It was as if something had gotten loose in the midst of the crowd. The followers of Jesus had become enthusiastically energetic, confident once again. Just as the Jewish leaders had stirred up the crowds against Jesus at the trial, the followers of Jesus had stirred up the crowd in their own language, about the new vision of God that was changing their life. These frightened and uncomfortable disciples had suddenly appeared. They had suddenly appeared and come out daring and courageous during the very disruptive time. It was on again. And as my friend is probably preaching, God had said, get your spirit on. And he was moving. God had spoken again. God had breathed once again into the world. Without warning, like the sound from heaven, like a strong gale force wind, spread like wildfire throughout the house. It rushed through and filled the entire house with the presence of God. God had suddenly come to his temple. Not the building. God had suddenly come into his temple, his people, his people's hearts. That's what Jesus was trying to say all along, that God would come and reside in you, not in a box. So God had come and appeared to them in a very different way, bringing the disciples a renewed sense of purpose, a renewed sense of power and presence, empowering them to share in the vision of God's holiness and difference. The disciples had become able to speak about the power and presence of God in a new way. God's voice, the language of faith, the word had just been spoken again in a different way. The voice and the language of God, the language of faith, can appear chaotic and confusing at first glance. However, in the midst of our unproductive schedules, it is exactly the presence of God's peace needed to rest upon our hearts. What a time it was that day when God would speak, when God's word was spoken in the breath of the Spirit. It was the middle of the winter a long time ago, a snow-covered neighborhood where a group of young kindergartners, and you know how kindergartners love a birthday party. Well, these kindergartners had gotten together for a birthday party of their friend. They played and talked, and after a while, one of the moms gathered them together in a circle so they could play games. 
And one particular game that they played was charades. And you know how charades works. You have somebody come out of the group, and they pick a paper out of the hat, and they read it, and they act it out without words, right? Oh my goodness, something just dawned on me. Without words, they act it out. Well, this little girl had gotten up, and she did this, and then she did this, and she went like this, and this little boy from the group, he jumps up and stands on his feet and says, I know what that is. It's, a, it's, a, it's my sister's favorite animal, and it's a, and it's a, and it's a, uh, uh. And one of the mothers stopped him and said, can you tell us what that is? started again. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, and I started to cry. The mom again said, Bobby, can you tell us what that is? I couldn't. I had it here. <laughs> and, but I just couldn't get it off my lips. My parents were called and I was taken to the Greater Baltimore Medical Center, which was a new children's wing downtown. Um, and then they were informed that I had had a stroke. Um, blood vessel ruptured in the right side of my brain, I mean, the left side of my brain, causing an interruption to my motor skills, and then I couldn't speak for about two weeks. Anyway, it came back, and Christy affirmed that. <laughs> There's a lot of people who affirm that. <laughs> But I think that time, it still strikes me is why I find words so powerful and special. And, and why I think about God who spoke in the beginning of creation and spoke the word of God through Jesus Christ. And, and words shouldn't be wasted or squandered. But, but somehow, we continue to waste the words that we're given. I, I want every word to say something of content. There are too many words floating around today and that, that don't really say anything. Too many people are trying to explain themselves or trying to defend what is right and wrong. But Pentecost reminds me once again of the holiness and sacredness of the nature of words. Words are special and should be a valued way of God's communication of his love. That the words spoke and, and, and creation happened. That the words spoke and Jesus was here. That the words spoke, that God spoke forth everything that is here. God speaks and things happen. When God speaks, things are moved to, to be occurring and moving and challenging and things move into being. The goodness and the blessings that come from God are spoken through the spirit of life. I believe that the church and our modern culture has so misused words that no one listens anymore. That everybody is just filling the air with words and nobody's listening. But when God speaks to us, people are moved to change. Maybe that's why God used such a dramatic way to speak to the people that afternoon at Pentecost. And like I said, words like believe and hope and redemption, words that used to belong to the church, are now being used by our culture for better banking services or selling cars or to sell us a political candidate, you know? And have we forgotten the power of God's word spoken through Christ Jesus? That this word can change our, our whole entire being. That God uses words as he energizes us. Not only do we need the season of Pentecost to reimagine the word of God upon our lives, but we need Pentecost experiences to remind us that our lives are filled with God's Holy Spirit and the presence of the word. 
the story tells us that they were waiting for something to happen. And suddenly from heaven, that's just a code phrase for where God is, from heaven, where God resides, there came a sound like the rush of a mighty wind. Interesting play on words, isn't it? That God pours forth the Spirit, as John says, out of a believer's heart shall flow rivers of living water. The Spirit of God is like that of a river of living water being poured out over all creation. Young men and old women, man, woman, Jew, Greek, Gentile, all creation is hearing and being moved by God's word. The act of Pentecost is God's way to revive the people of his community. To reshape the world after the holy righteousness of God. That Jesus tells us and his disciples that he still has many things to say to them. However, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into the truth. For he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. The things from God can only be comprehended in a spiritual way. Mary Lou Redding suggests that this explains much of the confusion people are experiencing trying to understand the Holy Spirit. Many modern churchy type people fear this experience of fierce wind and piercing flames resting on people who speak in all kinds of languages that they've never heard before. And God is still speaking to the church today through the power of the Holy Spirit that moves us to give food and clothing to people who can't quite make it. That the church is being moved to give food to children leaving schools. That the power of the Spirit is bringing back together a church here at Mount Bethel in dinners on Wednesday night. That are able to sing on Sunday morning through choir and other music. That the church is, is a powerful force of wind blowing across Bahamian. North Carolina and into Durham and up into parts of Virginia with the love of God. It is essential that the church relearns this language of faith and look toward God for renewal. Our world needs a, a spirit of holiness to speak the language of faith in the God of heaven that will come upon us like the sound of a rushing mighty wind. I wonder what ways God might come upon us to reform this community of faith. It's already happening. What new configurations is the Holy Spirit moving us toward as we reshape ourselves after God's holy wind spoken to us in the word of Jesus Christ? The Spirit encourages us to move into the world with the love of Jesus. And the love of Jesus is to be shown and spoken to everyone. And when it's spoken to everyone, we use our hands, our feet, our eyes, our heart, our legs, our arms, and we even use words when we have to. I wonder what dramatic event the Holy Spirit is, is calling Mount Bethel to. Whether it be the spirit of gentleness that is calling us, or whether it's the spirit of restlessness that is stirring us up in a way, the Spirit speaks to everybody in a special way, encouraging everyone in here to be moved and empowered by the way of God. God's word. Spoken, heard, and used. Amen.
Christianists, please bless the use of these gifts for the glory of your name and the family of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray.